piezoelectricity from quartz crystals, earthquakes, and the secrets of gold nugget formations. What do they all have in common? Well, we're gonna go over that today. So let's get into it. Hey guys, it's your favorite gold miner prospector and geologist, Jeff Williams. I get a lot of questions asking me, Jeff, where do gold nuggets come from? And that's a very complex question because a lot of geologists, geophysicists, and scientists have wanted to know that for a long time. Now I'm gonna go over the basics of where gold nuggets come from, but then I'm gonna introduce to you a new theory that has just recently been proposed that gold nuggets may have their origin in piezoelectricity caused from the movement of tectonic plates or what's better known as earthquakes. Now recently a paper was published in a scientific journal stating that scientists had done several experiments using quartz crystal and very fine gold. In fact it's so fine it's ionic gold. Now as far as gold precipitating out of solution due to electrical currents caused by piezoelectricity scientists have discovered that if they stress quartz crystals inside of a gold rich ionic solution that gold particles start to collect. It's really crazy and once a few collect then those those attract even more and masses start to form under those conditions and that would just support the theory that whenever there's an earthquake that's crushing these quartz crystals which causes piezoelectricity that they are actually attracting more ionic gold out of solution from the hydrothermal fluids that are circulating through all the quartz that's been broken up in these bread shaded zones and this process can usually take thousands if not millions of years gold nuggets can come from a whole host of other places that you didn't even think about I'm gonna explain to you guys for those of you that don't know how gold nuggets are formed in nature and at the end of the video I'm going to give you locations of where you can find these gold nuggets. Now for most of you guys out there you already know the basics of how gold nuggets come to be. They're usually referred to as secondary gold deposits and they are derived from primary gold deposits which is load gold and what I mean by that is there's usually an outcropping that has some type of gold inside of it free mill and it weathers and erodes off of that particular load outcrop. This is referred to as alluvial deposits. As erosion and weathering take place, that particular deposit makes its way by gravity to the lowest point, which is usually in the bottoms of washes, arroyos, and creeks and rivers. And this is probably stuff that you already know, but there are other environments that I'm sure you haven't heard of that large masses of gold, which equate into gold nuggets, form in. And one of those is biomicroorganisms. I know, strange, huh? There's bacteria out there that actually dissolves gold and can redeposit it as waste material, and this accumulation can actually start to form gold nuggets. It's amazing. And one place that this is really prevalent in is Quartzite, Arizona. The, the shaped nuggets are actually found to be in a bacterial setting which grows in place and we find it as close as six inches away from the jagged nuggets. I believe this is a nugget that is shaped in a cluster, but we're going to find out. We're going to break it out here. Here's a close-up of the nugget. You can see it in there that because the gold is very soft and you don't want to hurt the nuggets. There's the nugget broken out of the out of the rock. It's much bigger. So then what we do with that is we'll take the nitric acid. We'll put this in nitric acid. It eats the rock away and then you can see the actual nugget. You can see it, the, the nugget itself shining in there. And another way the gold nuggets can form is when they're hosted in limonite from a polymetallic replacement deposit. We've seen it ourselves. It looks like this. This is what the old timers were looking for. It's iron oxide, a thick vein of it, about uh, six to eight inches thick. Now when we looked it up on the USGS report, we found out that this mine on the other side of this hill produced somewhere in the average range of two ounces per ton of rock. The vein travels at a 45 degree angle. If you look up towards the contact zones here, right here, that's nothing but solid iron iron in there because we're going to take a rock drill and we're going to drill into this this uh, vein right here and we're going to sample in further <laughs> Imagine doing this for 10 to 12 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't know how the old timers did it. You want gold? You gotta earn it. Oh, now if that ain't beautiful, I don't know what is. You can see it all in there. There's a nice chunk right there. That could almost be a nugget. See all the fines up in there? 
is I've taken a lot of this material back to the house and I've let it sit over a number of years. And what I've discovered is it's still growing nuggets out of that gold rich limonite, even though I can't see it, it's starting to collect and form wire masses. It's incredible, it looks like this. There's some wire gold right there. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, there's some gold right there locked up in this clay, but all the gold is in these little pockets like this and, and there's lots and lots of it. Now the other ways that gold can actually form in large masses in quartz crystals has been known by geophysicists and geologists such as myself for years. But before we can understand how gold nuggets or masses of gold actually form in some of these hosted gold deposits, we have to understand the whole process of where does gold come from? Now I've already made a video on the subject and I'll leave a link down below in case you want to see the in-depth version. But the basics of it all is gold is transported by two different mechanisms, a sulfur complex and a chlorine complex. And as far as gold and sulfur complexes, that would cover your orogenic hosted gold deposits like in the mother low country of California, your sedimentary hosted gold deposits like you have in the Carlin Trend, and then your epithermal gold deposits like you have here in Nevada. And when gold is transported in a chlorine or chloride complex, it's usually in the form of a porphyry or high sulfidation or scarn deposit. Now, as far as a sulfur complex is concerned, that's why you see gold associated with iron pyrite because the sulfur under the right temperatures and pressure acts as a solvent and will actually put gold in solution. It's referred to as a redox or a reducer oxidator. And what happens is, is as long as there's no outside influence like changing of the pH balance or temperatures or pressures or a source of iron, then the gold will stay in solution. But when there's iron present and in the hydrothermal fluids, the sulfur will react with the iron and it will bond with the iron and it'll drop the gold. You see how that works? That's why gold always wears an iron hat or rides an iron horse is because the sulfur is transporting the gold to the surface and when it encounters iron rich rocks, the sulfur drops the gold instantly and then it starts to form pyrite with the iron. And through weathering and oxidation, the sulfur is liberated from the iron, leaving just the iron and the gold. And that's why the gold will form on the outer lattices of the pyrite cubes. When all that sulfur is liberated from these cubes of iron, the gold and the iron is left behind, but sometimes the iron will still take the shape of a pyrite cube. And those are referred to as pyrite pseudomorphs. And the mineral that's left behind is referred to as gothite. And if it weathers completely away, it'll leave what's called box works. That's all those funny little empty boxes that you see inside of quartz. Now, if it continues to break down, it'll turn into limonite. That's why you find a lot of gold in limonite. And that's why you have these massive gaussons sitting on top of these load deposits. A lot of old timers would look for these gaussons because they knew that that used to be pyrite and it's oxidized all the sulfur out and if there's any gold left behind it, it'll be easy to get. Now the deposit we're working down here is referred to as a paleoplaster deposit because it's derived from some of the outcroppings on the hills millions of years ago that have eroded away and deposited down here in these lower basins. And then later we had an inland sea here in Nevada which created a lot of deposition of these clays, silts, and sands. And that's why you get gypsum crystals in these clay seams. I wouldn't be a bit surprised to find an ichiosaur down here. Ew, icky. And in fact, we have found fossils down here in the cave systems in the very older workings of this drift mine. And in, at one point, we're giving them away. It looks like this. Just to give you an idea how low the ceiling is on this cave, that's my foot. All right, let's get on in there. Let's see what we can find. <sighs> oh yeah. That's a weird looking one. Look at that. I don't know what that is. There's a shell. See the shell? Look at that. For those of you out there that don't know how we do this, how we advance our drift, we'll either drill eight holes into the clay seams to act as a relief, just like in blasting hard rock, or we'll notch out a square hole right in the center, and that will be our relief. And it'll be a lot easier to bring the stuff in, just like on conventional blasting. See all of our red clays that are in here, all these different clay seams, and the different strata of caliche in here, 
See all this calcium carbonate? And look at this, this is sand. This is 10 million year old sand right here. Look at this. It hasn't formed into sandstone yet. Isn't that amazing? You're actually looking at history. Now there's three very specific caliche beds down here which have gold on it. But the last one that we drilled into has the most gold. And that's what we're drifting along right now. That's why we call it a drip mine. The gold is phenomenal. And here's an example of some of the gold nuggets that we mine out of here on a regular basis. And the gold that's coming out of the sump is even richer. You can see that band of red clay down there and it just keeps going and gets softer and softer. And we believe that it connects in with the legendary cocoa reef or river of gold near the eastern border of california just 65 miles from the glitzy city of las vegas and nestled among the ivan palm mountains is cocoa reef peak from the outside it looks just like any other california mountain but if earl door is to be believed inside runs a river of gold the people working on cocoa reef peak believe in earl door's river of gold and they all have stories to tell of how they got involved with this project. Ralph Lewis is responsible for the day-to-day -day workings at Coco Weef. Basically, I believe in the, the legend. Uh, originally, most people don't realize that it stems from an Indian legend. Earl Dorr is supposed to have gotten his maps and information from the Indians. He says he did what he did. Nobody knows. Uh, he's supposed to have concealed the entrance, you know, to, to prevent anybody else from having it. If he couldn't have it, nobody else could have it, as far as what his relatives tell us. He decided to return to the cave and set off two explosions to seal the natural entrance. Stories vary as to whether or not the other two prospectors were in the cave at the time. The mine site buzzes with activity on a daily basis. Basically, we get going about 7 o'clock in the morning and uh, spend our whole day drill in for as much as 10 hours if we have bad ground. We'll drill 27 to 32 holes, depending on the type of ground, whether it's soft or hard rock. And right now we're drilling about seven feet and pulling all that rock. Um, so seven foot a day, because we'd like to be down underneath Cocoa Weef Cave. After we drill the holes, we'll uh, stuff our primers in the back, that is the, the dynamite with the fuse and whatnot. It's uh, ammonium nitrate, it's kind of like fertilizer. We'll set them off usually with safety fuse, but uh, sometimes we'll use electric detonation. We did today, for instance. It's a little easier to control the time of, of electric detonation. Blast it out, we'll spend the next day just mucking it out. Muck is uh, ore that's uh, not valuable. <laughs> rocks should throw away. So we'll muck the, the rocks out with that slusher bucket. And uh, you know, as soon as the tunnel's clean, we'll, we'll set it up to drill again. Work continues in the tunnels. There's a, an element of adventure to it. I like the people here. But basically, I believe the river's there, that the caverns exist that it's the eighth wonder of the world. And all the fossils that we've been finding are in the cave systems that are back down that way in the older workings. Ooh, but we hear water rushing down there and we think that system connects with our sump. It's just a matter of drilling down and getting past all those nasty red worms. Blah. And we're gonna be drilling through into the sump next week because we gotta find out what's down there because we could definitely use the water. And if our calculations are correct, we only have a few more feet to go before we punch through because it's getting really soupy down there. But there's worms down there. Huge, two inch in diameter, nasty thing. Blah. They look like this. All the gold.
gold that we mine out of here, we give directly to our premium patrons. It's just our way of saying thank you for helping us keep the dream alive. Because without their continued support, we could never have dropped this shaft and advanced this drift for so many years. In fact, we give away 10 bags of pay dirt from this drift mine and all the gold nuggets that we find every month. But not only that, we also give away a brand new Mine Lab Gold Monster 1000 metal detector every month as well. Not to mention, we host gold tours and you'll have access to our store that has our book in it, over 40 years of experience written by me and Slim. You'll be finding gold in no time. And to commemorate our anniversary, me and my wife are giving away a huge bag of gold pay dirt for September. This thing is a monster, a monster. Now, if you want to get involved with this, all you got to do is look for the little icon at the end of the video that looks like that. Click on it, make a $10 pledge, and you're in like Flynn. And I'll see you on the next video. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.